Hello again, class. All right, we're going to do another lecture uh, in our series of lectures about the early republic. Uh, this time, uh, well, it looks like from the screen we're going to be focusing on James Madison. Uh, we're really not going to talk about Madison much. Instead, we're going to focus on uh, what was the uh, by far the dominant occurring event during his presidency, which was the War of 1812. Before we get back, uh, let's let's do uh, spend a minute or so on James Madison. So, who was he? Uh, he was a Democratic Republican uh, from Virginia. Okay, so he was basically Thomas Jefferson was, was sort of like his mentor to him. So he held a lot of the same views uh, during this early Republic period as Jefferson. Uh, now, remember, if you go back to the Constitution era when the Constitution was being written. Uh, he and Hamilton teamed up to write the Federalist Papers to get the Constitution uh, ratified. But once the uh, Constitution was ratified, he, he really joined forces uh, with Jefferson, uh, worked in the Democratic Republican Party, uh, and opposed most of Hamilton's ideas. Uh, and like all these presidents from Virginia, uh, he was a slaveholder. Um, uh, he's known as father of the Constitution. Um, we talked about that quite a bit before. Uh, and finally, he was Jefferson's Secretary of State. All right, so if you remember, uh, Thomas Jefferson was George Washington's Secretary of State. Uh, James Madison is going to be Jefferson's Secretary of State. Then he becomes president. Uh, we're going to see this pattern uh, continue. Uh, during the, the early years of the Republic, um, if you could become Secretary of State, you had a good chance of, of going on to become president. It was considered a very prestigious position. But as I said, uh, Madison's presidency uh, is really known for, for one thing, um, and that's the War of 1812, or uh, as, uh, as I'll also call it, uh, that time Great Britain burned down the White House. Okay. So, you know, Madison uh, becomes president uh, in 1809. But his presidency is known for the tensions with, with Great Britain uh, and ultimately that ultimately lead to war in 1812. All right, so why did Britain and America go to war again in 1812? One, uh, and this is the, the overwhelming reason. I mean, if you just polled the random person and give you one reason the War of 1812 began, uh, they're probably going to tell you impressment. Uh, remember, impressment is, is the kidnapping of one country's sailors uh, and making them serve in, in the kidnapping countries' navies. All right, so Britain uh, would kidnap American sailors and make them work in, in Britain's navy. All right, so that's the overwhelming, the number one reason most people would give you for the War of 1812. Um, I don't know that it was necessarily more important than these other issues, but it's certainly a big one and one you need to remember. Uh, the second is Britain's interference with American trade. Uh, and third, uh, Britain uh, was helping... Uh, Native American revolts uh, in the Northwest Territories. All right, so we'll talk about all three of these reasons uh, in a little bit more detail as we go. All right, so first, uh, impressment. All right, so we've talked about this before when we were talking about some background of the XYZ affair. Impressment means uh, one country like Britain kidnapping another country's, like America's, sailors and forcing them into uh, the first country's Navy. All right, so take a look at that picture I have. That's sort of what impressment would look like. Now, what's the background of this? One is is because Britain needed sailors to fight France. Um, I know this may come as a shock, uh, but Britain and France were once again uh, fighting a war in 1812, or the years leading up to 1812. Okay. So that's that's one reason they were impressing um, American sailors. Is that they needed they needed manpower to fight France. Another reason is Britain sort of held this view that anyone born in Great Britain was always British, um, and so they felt that that people who had moved to America uh, and were not claiming to be American uh, were still in fact British and therefore should have been subject to you know the military draft laws and things like that uh, to be forced into the navy. Now there there definitely were some examples of of people in the British Navy 
basically abandoning uh, the British Navy, uh, deserting uh, the British Navy, and then you know catching on and working in America. That, that did happen. Uh, but Britain also wasn't real scrupulous or specific uh, when they started rounding up people uh, to impress. So uh, maybe they captured people who deserted from the British Navy, and maybe they didn't. All right, so this was impressive. This is the first reason. Uh, Britain was impressing America's sailors, and uh, eventually America just said, enough's enough. And, and we did see this earlier. Uh, remember, France was kind of doing the same things in advance of the XYZ affair, and that's why the, that quasi-war with France broke out. And, and John Adams was almost forced to go, go to war with France over the same issue. Uh, eventually, uh, when Britain is doing it to American sailors, it, it does, in fact, lead to war. Uh, the second reason, uh, Britain didn't want America trading with France. Remember, Britain and France are at war, and so with America bringing goods to France, Britain sees that as America sort of helping France in the war. Uh, now, from American standpoints, they were just trying to sell their goods. They were just trying to make money uh, for the most part. Uh, but Britain saw it as helping France's war effort, so they wanted to put a stop to it. Uh, so British ships would capture American cargo and merchant ships that were heading to Europe. Um, now, so honest, so obviously, uh, you know, this is going to make the Americans mad for a couple reasons. One, it's just um, it, it's a threat to Americans' independence and sovereignty if Britain thinks it can control where American ships do, do not go. Uh, and the second reason, it's costing Americans money. You know, if you have all these goods that that you're supposed to be selling in France. Well, if the ship doesn't get to France, then, then you don't make your money. So Americans were not happy with the same things with their trade. Uh, the third reason we'll talk about are, are Native American revolts. Right, so Britain helped and encouraged Native Americans in the Ohio River Valley to resist uh, America's westward expansion. All right, so remember, go back to the Treaty of Paris of 1783. One of the terms of that treaty was that uh, Britain gave all the land, basically, at least all the land south of Canada, uh, that was west of the Appalachian Mountains all the way to the Mississippi River. Um, and, and at least the northern half of that section of land we call the Ohio River Valley. Right, and eventually, America is going to create five states, you know, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, out of that land. So, um, you know, that's American land. Right. And so, again, you don't have to write all the, the details of the Native Americans' revolts. Just understand that Britain was, was helping uh, Native Americans, or at least encouraging them, to, to fight back against uh, American expansion into the West. So as Americans moved west into the Ohio River Valley, which is also called the Northwest Territory, remember the, the Northwest Ordinance, talked about how you settled that territory, you know, conflicts with Native Americans were um, inevitably... Uh, that means it can't be prevented. They were inevitably going to arise right? because obviously the Native Americans had been living there for hundreds of years, perhaps in, in some instances, and all of a sudden these Americans moved in and started taking the land. Um, now, so one Native American chief, a guy named Tecumseh of the Shawnee tribe, he tried to organize different tribes uh, into a resistance, but uh, William Henry Harrison uh, convinced. Uh, separate tribes, the Miami, Delaware, uh, Potawatomi tribes, to, uh, to sign a treaty of Fort Wayne and transfer three million acres of land to the Americans. All right, so Tecumseh, and this was one way that the Americans were, were often able to, to defeat Native Americans, even though there, there were many more Native Americans in certain parts of the area. Uh, the Americans would, would bargain or, or team up with one group of Native Americans against another, and so they would uh, divide and conquer is, is the is the term to use there, and so that's what William Henry Harrison, he was an American general, did. And then while Tecumseh's way, Harrison defeated Tecumseh's tribe, the Shawnee tribe, uh, at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Right, and this is going to make Harrison very, very famous. This this victory, um, so famous that William Henry Harrison is eventually going to become president. Um, and what's What's ironic about that is Harrison becomes 
you know, wins all these battles. We're going to talk about him. He's going to win some key battles in the War of 1812. As a general, he survives all these battles, fighting against the Native Americans, fighting against the British. Um, but then when he becomes president, he's going to give a speech on his inauguration day. It was really bad weather. Uh, he gets sick and dies within a month. So uh, William Henry Harrison uh, survived uh, lots of battles uh, in his life, but he couldn't survive giving a, a really long speech as, as president. Right. So, in 1811, after Harrison uh, wins the Battle of Tippecanoe, Tecumseh goes into Canada and becomes allies with the British. Okay. And, and hence, this is where some of this animosity uh, against the Americans, against the British, like, hey, we're at war with this guy, and you're making allies uh, with him and his tribe, and you're you're trying to get them to, to fight back in the Ohio River Valley or the Northwest Territory. All right. So, those were the, the three reasons uh, that led up to war. Now, and this is true for many wars, um, you know, when a country goes to war, it doesn't necessarily mean that 100% of the people are in favor of that war. A lot of times there are big arguments about it, because going to war is a very important uh, decision, so usually there are lots and lots of debates and arguments about it. In the War of 1812, um, or this was certainly true of the War of 1812, and so many Federalist politicians opposed the war. And so the members of Congress who pushed for the war uh, were called war hawks. All right, so look at that that picture on the the right. Uh, that's a war hawk, uh, because you know for a long time a, a dove has been a symbol of peace. Right? Doves are often you know the bird those doves are often used as a symbol of peace. And so here in your cartoon you're seeing that the war hawks overcome these these doves, these anti-war doves who wanted peace. Uh, the war hawks are the people who are in favor of war. And so in 1812, uh, for the first time ever, Congress voted to actually declare war on another country. Uh, remember in the Constitution, it says that Congress must declare war and that the president is the commander-in-chief of the military. So, 1812 is a, a, a new first for the country. We declare war on, <clears throat> on a foreign power, namely Britain. Now, obviously, we'd fought Britain before, but that was before the Constitution was written. That's before we had uh, the Congress uh, that we do today. And so this is a first. All right. Now, this is not, uh, I believe I told you this when we talked about the Revolutionary War. This isn't a military history class, so uh, we're not going to break down, you know, a lot of military strategy and tactics and that sort of thing. Uh, we're just going to hit the highlights. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, some of the the more major events of the War of 1812. And a lot of this I won't even ask you to write down or put in your notes. Just listen, uh, kind of understand what's going on. But you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to give you a quiz over you know the specific battle dates and plans of, of all these particular battles. All right. So Britain. Um, their strategy is simple. They're going to blockade the USA and stop them trading from to and from other countries. Uh, they could do this, and remember, a blockade's when when one navy uses all of its ships to 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 keep the other uh, country ships from from leaving land or getting to their land. <clears throat> uh, remember the the French blockade at Yorktown during the Revolutionary War. All right, so Britain's going to do it to America this time, and, and they're going to stop American trade with to and from other countries. Now, this is the background, but I want you to remember this. This is going to have a big impact on, on the American economy. So, uh, the USA people in America start thinking, hey, well, you know, these British, they're based in Canada because Canada was still a, a British colony. Uh, a lot of their armies there. This is a good uh, chance for us to make Canada part of the United States. Uh, you know, there, there was a thinking in America that they were going to use this War of 1812 as an excuse, basically, to conquer Canada, uh, and Canada could, I guess, become, you know, one of the states. Uh, didn't quite, quite, quite work out that way. Uh, but America does attack Canada. Uh, they set fire to a, a city at the time called York. Now it's called Toronto. But Britain fights back. Britain eventually captures Detroit. Um, but then they lose it again when General Harrison, all right, so 
again, we're talking about William Henry Harrison. Uh, General Harrison is going to win this battle. It's going to be called the Battle of uh, Things. Uh, and Tecumseh actually dies at this battle. All right, so so one of the key figures in the events leading up to the war uh, is going to die at this battle. And so basically, what happened is America attacked Canada. Canada and the British attack America, and at the end of it, everybody kind of ended up with the same land that they started with. Uh, and that's that's going to be a theme in this war, by the way. Everybody's going to end up. I'll give you a spoiler here. Everybody's going to kind of end up exactly where they started. Um, now, do write this down, because this is something you absolutely need to remember the War of 1812. Uh, Britain attacks Washington, D.C., and burns down the Capitol building and the White House. Right. Particularly the White House had suffered a lot of damage. Um, so that's one. Write that down. The War of 1812 is when British uh, burned down the White House. Or at least they fired it. The whole thing didn't collapse. But a lot of it was damaged and had to be rebuilt. Um, the second big thing that I want you to write down about the War of 1812 is that it led to the, uh, the National Anthem. All right, so now maybe you know or don't know this. Washington, D.C. and Baltimore are very close together. All right, today, you know, you can probably drive from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore in about an hour, maybe. Maybe a little more, but they're very close together. So after attacking D.C., Washington then and goes attacks Baltimore, the city of Baltimore, which is in Maryland. And they're trying to capture this fort called the Fort McHenry. And this lawyer, um, and, and this lawyer named Francis Scott Key was, was actually at the time on a British ship. He was doing some legal work. Uh, they made him stay on the British ship until after the battle was over. And so he's watching this battle uh, take place, um, and it's going on at night. And, you know, and every time there's a, a, a bombshell goes off and the sky lights up from the, the fires and the bombs, uh, he sees that the American flag is still, still flying over Fort McHenry. Uh, and that's what leads him to write the Star Spangled Banner, uh, which eventually is going to become our national anthem. All right? And so that's why if you think about the words of the Star Spangled Banner, uh, you know, he's talking about the dawn's early light, and you can still see the flag, and the, you know, the bombs bursting in air. He's describing this battle, and he's describing how uh, how hopeful he was, and how happy he was that every time uh, there was enough light to see the the fort, he could see that the American flag was still flying, which meant that the British hadn't captured it. So, absolutely remember that the War of eighteen twelve led to the White House being set on fire, and it gave us our national anthem. Okay, um, as we've learned before, uh, once two sides stop fighting a war, you, you have a treaty. Uh, a treaty ends a war. It's a negotiated terms that the both sides agree on. Uh, and for once, uh, we're going to talk about a treaty that's not called the Treaty of Paris. You know, we had a Treaty of Paris in the French and Indian War, a Treaty of Paris in the Revolutionary War. Uh, this one's going to be called the Treaty of Ghent. All right, and notice that date. It was signed on Christmas Eve, 1814. That's, that's going to be important in a minute. We're going to talk about that again in a minute. All right, so the Treaty of Ghent was signed. Uh, and as I told you, the War of 1812, basically both sides kind of went back to how they were uh, beforehand. Nothing really changed. Uh, the Treaty of Ghent did not resolve trade disputes. Neither country gained nor lost any territory. Um in other words, neither side really won the war. All right. Now, I say that, I will tell you that Americans, you know, immediately after this war, kind of felt that they had won, uh, even though they didn't, you know, gain any, any territory or, or convince Britain to, uh, to resolve any of these trade disputes. America felt like it won the war. Uh, it had gone against one of the, the greatest um, military powers in the world, and this time they didn't even have France to help it. And America had basically fought it to a draw, fought it on equal terms. Uh, and so America felt that, hey, we just showed that we're as, as big and strong and as powerful as, as Great Britain. Um, and so Americans really felt good about themselves at the end, end of this war. Um, now, not to burst their bubble, part of it was because Britain at the time was, in fact, also fighting uh, a war against France over in Europe that was kind of drawing off part of its attention. Um, 
you know, but the Americans didn't see it that way. They just thought, you know, the British sent an army here to attack us, and we fought them off, and now they've left, so therefore we won. And that's going to be important about the legacies of the war. Okay. So now let's talk about the most famous battle of the war, the Battle of New Orleans. And so you're probably confused here because I just told you that the war had ended, and now I told you we're going to talk about the most famous battle. And yes, the most famous battle of the war, the Battle of New Orleans, takes place after the Treaty of Ghent is signed. But Ghent is a city in Europe. And so, you know, the, the negotiators and the diplomats signed this treaty over in Europe, you know, in December of, of 1814, but no one in America finds out about it for, for a while. And so in January 1815, uh, the armies, neither army, neither the British army nor the American army, uh, knows about the treaty. All right, so they're still fighting. And in January of 1815, uh, the British Navy attacks New Orleans. Okay, have 7,500 soldiers, and they attack New Orleans. Um, and that's because, why do they want New Orleans? Remember from our lesson on the Louisiana Purchase. If you control the Mississippi River, uh, you control the inner part of, of North America. Uh, the Mississippi River dominates all, all movement of people and goods uh, in the interior of the continent. So, controlling the Mississippi River is of huge, huge strategic importance. <clears throat> so the British wanted to control it. But uh, this general named Andrew Jackson uh, really routed the British. Uh, I mean, it wasn't even close. All right, so America, you know, had 71 casualties about, you know, killed or wounded. Britain had around 2,000. Right? I mean, this was uh, just an absolutely one-sided battle. <clears throat> uh, that General Jackson won, uh, which is going to propel him uh, um, to great fame in the country. He's going to become one of the more famous and popular Americans after this. Uh, so what's going to happen? One thing we see in the War of 1812, uh, America is going to get two presidents out of it. It's going to get Andrew Jackson, uh, who's going to become president, you know, um, about 15, 20 years later. And it's going to get William Henry Harrison um, after it. So, so two of the generals, two of the leading American generals are both going to become presidents um, after the war. Okay, so I know we've gone through this war pretty quickly because um, it's, you know, it's a war most Americans today kind of forget about. They don't think about it much. Um, I mean, you mentioned the War of 1812. It's like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That's tend to how people think of the War of 1812. But it actually had some very important um, important consequences. Not not just giving us two presidents who got famous during the war, uh, but it really kind of changed the country. Alright, so what is this legacy? What What is so important about the War of 1812? Well, you have both from a political and economic standpoint. Now let's talk about the political. Americans became more patriotic and they gained a sense of nationalism. This is an identification with one's own country. Alright, as I was mentioning earlier, Americans absolutely felt that they won this war. All right, they felt that, hey, we just fought one of the greatest militaries on earth, and we won. Now, you can debate whether it was really a win or a tie, but at the time, Americans thought it was a win. And so they were proud of themselves. You know, they, they really started to view themselves as being equal to these European countries. Like, hey, we're just as great as Europe or France or Spain or whoever you want to talk about. All right, Americans really started gaining a sense of patriotism and nationalism after this war. Right. Uh, the Federalist Party was basically destroyed because it opposed the war. All right. So now we've seen the only Federalist president we had was John Adams. All right. And so you'd already had Democratic Republicans win. Uh, Thomas Jefferson won two elections as a Democratic Republic. James Madison had won two elections as a Democratic Republican. All right. and, and so... You know, the Federalist popularity was already going down. You know, they had the John Adams, you had the XYZ affair, you had the uh, Alien Sedition Acts, and so this really harmed the popularity of the Federalists to begin with. And then in 1812 rolls around, and they're opposing the war. Um, well, that was an, a very, very unpopular position. And so the Federalist Party was basically destroyed uh, as a result of this war. Uh -huh. 
And then after this, uh, Native American resistance uh, or the ability of Native Americans to, to fight back against the Americans in the Northwest Territory, uh, again, that's also known as the Ohio River Valley, uh, it's weakened, almost being to the point of non-existence. All right, America's going to, to be able to move in that Northwest Territory in future years without too much resistance from, from Native Americans. All right, and as I mentioned, uh, eventually, now it's going to take, you know, 20 or 30 years, uh, but both General Andrew Jackson and William Henry Harrison are both going to be elected president. Uh, and, and you see a, a pattern in America. Uh, it hasn't necessarily held true, say, the last 50 years, but certainly in the early years. Uh, being a famous general was going to help you get elected president. You had George Washington. Uh, you had Andrew Jackson. You had William Henry Harrison. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about a couple more examples of that as the, the years go on. Or, I'm sorry, as, as this school year goes on. All right, now let's talk about the economic consequences, because these are just as important, maybe perhaps more important even, uh, than the political consequences. One, Americans become more independent and self-sufficient. Okay, now remember, let's go back to when we talked about, you know, Alexander Hamilton, and he wanted a an economy based on manufacturing, and so he he wanted to to put in place protective tariffs that were going to raise the price of British and European goods uh, to help a man American manufacturer sell their sell their goods. And, and that helped a little bit. Uh, but the War of 1812 helped a lot. All right, a lot, a lot. Because, remember that blockade we talked about at the first of this lesson? Uh, Britain was blocking all trade between America and Europe. So if America wanted, you know, some goods, whether it's clothing or furniture or tools or what have you, and, uh, if America wanted goods, they basically had to make them, them make them themselves. All right. And so this is going to, to be a large part in turning America more into a manufacturing industrial power. All right. So now this is ironic because remember the Democratic Republicans wanted an economy based on um, based on farming, not on manufacturing. But when, when you had Jefferson's Embargo Act of 1807 that that forbid trade between America and uh, Europe. And then you had the War of 1812 that also stopped trade between America and Europe. These two things, uh, these two things put in place by Democratic Republicans are actually going to lead to much, much more manufacturing in America. It's going to lead to America uh, moving towards uh, more of a manufacturing economy and away from uh, an agricultural economy. All right, so it's ironic that the people who we're hoping to keep uh, agriculture at the, the forefront of the American economy uh, are going to make the decisions that, that lead to the opposite taking place. Right. So, as we said, American manufacturing increases and America starts manufacturing its own goods. Okay, that's, that's the big economic consequence of this war. Sorry, I apologize for that. Let me go back. All right. So that's the big uh, economic consequence. At the end of the day, America is moving, taking another huge step uh, towards really becoming a manufacturing power, even though, as I said, uh, that's really not what the Democratic Republicans wanted. They wanted more of an agrarian or agriculture-based economy. Uh, but uh, it was, you know, they were the ones pushing the war, and uh, it was their war that really pushed America towards manufacturing. All right, so as you saw when I accidentally hit, hit the Ford button, uh, this is going to end the discussion of Madison. Next time we'll talk about James Monroe uh, and uh, what we call the era of good feelings and the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, that'll be for next time. Uh, but this time, let's just sum up uh, the War of 1812. Um, started because of impressment um, and interference with trade and Native American revolts in the Northwest Territory. Uh, the key events were you know, the White House being set on fire by British soldiers and Francis Scott Key writing the Star-Spangled Banner that would turn into the National Anthem. Uh, the big war hero of it, uh, in addition to William Henry Harrison, was General Andrew Jackson uh, for winning the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, and then the, the big legacy is, is America becomes much more patriotic, and, and they start um, economically making their own goods. All right, So America really gets this more sense of, hey, we are an independent country. We can stand on ourselves, uh, both from a political 
standpoint as well as an economic standpoint. All right, so um, obviously, um, you know, that's an overview. You can't discuss the entire War of 1812 in half an hour like I did, uh, but that at least gives you the highlights of the War of 1812. As I said, next time we'll turn to James Monroe.